Welcome to another episode of the Happy Hour. It's your boy, Mr. Overtime, along with my cousins. Mikey Slacks. Dry And today we got a good friend of mine and a special guest, uh, my man Tucky. What's happening, baby? What's up with you, How you, you know doing? What I mean, I didn't want to hit him with a proper. I'll let you introduce you to the first name and everything. It's my guy, Tuck. Uh, Oakland native, man. Introduce yourself to the fans out there, man, and let them know uh, what you're doing here on the happy hour. First off, thank y'all for having me. I appreciate y'all sharing y'all platform with me and my brand. Uh, my name is Alfonso Tucky Blunt Jr. Uh, I'm a weed man. Shit, I guess is the best way to call it. But <laughs> no, nah, uh, I'm a father, husband. <laughs> Um, just an Oakland kid that's been selling weed a long time, and now I'm doing it legally in the same zip code I was arrested for selling cannabis in. So you gotta that's to that. what's up. Oh, salute, you keep it happy. salute, salute. Hey, yes, us being yes. the happy hour show, uh, my man, as he says, you know, he is he is uh, one of the dank kings out there in the East Bay. Uh, <clears throat> Let's put a little emphasis on that part right now. You know what I'm saying? Being the plug out there at the Happy Store. Mm -hmm. Talk about the address, man, where it resides into the historic landmark over there in the town. So, Blunts and Moore is the first retail store opened under the social equity program with, um, within Oakland. It's a social equity program. It's a program designed to give people who caught cannabis cases chances at ownership within the cannabis space. I'm the first person, first ex-felon, to open a dispensary out of that program. Oh, yeah. um, 701 66th Avenue is the address. Yeah, first, you last. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. And the address is symbolic to Oakland people because I used to be the Napa Auto Parts building. Mm -hmm. And it's directly across from the Oakland Alameda Coliseum, which is called the Ring Central or something now. But where the A's and, and Raiders used to play in the Warriors. Or Arena, baby. I'm directly across the street. So for mm -hmm. me, being from Oakland, to be able to sell weed, in Oakland legally, again, in the same zip code that's been on my ID mm. since 1993 when I first got my ID at 13 years old. To be able to sell weed legally in that section is fucking amazing. Can I cuss? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Man. Okay. Man. So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, we in Oakland. I'm from Oakland, but I'm also really like, not to say you're from Oakland, but then you're from the Bay. Like, I'm really tapped in with everybody from here to New York. Before uh, cannabis, I mean, excuse me, up. excuse me. Before legal cannabis, legal, 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 legal <laughs> cannabis. <laughs> now, I know, hey, I'm, a, I'm no longer a felon, so yes, I can talk about whatever I want to talk about. Yes, but yeah. no, like to be able to do this and then be able to have the vouching from the people that I know in the space that you know I know in the space. You know, we'll talk about whatever, but yeah. people can vouch for me before I got legal. They just saying you've been doing this, so it's about time that you actually did it. So. To be the first is amazing. And then Sean Richards is the second. I was about to say, my man that's out my here, uh, uh, another community activist out here, someone that's changed his life around, spent years uh, teaching the youth of San Francisco uh, doing sports. Uh, I know him from being a fellow coach to the SF 49ers out here. He held down the Brown Bombers for a long time. Oh. He's in the city. Uh, he does a lot of work for the city, and it's a blessing oh, to yeah. see y'all. And it, it not to be too cliche it being in the middle of black history month man i thought it'd be great to get you on here being a black business owner even, yeah, you know what i mean and not only crazy. that uh, a friend of mine that i know that's really you know leveled up in this space and and in that space you have you have touched on some really great things that we'll get to in a minute you know but uh my man's been studying hey. he got his tassels right but we'll get into that <laughs> in a minute. but uh let's go back to the beginning man being an oakland native you know what i'm saying and who you really are and the principles that kind of got you to be the man that you are today, because uh, reading your your professional bio is it, it, it's, it's 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 amazing, man. You know, growing up in the '80s and in the town, you know, we talking about Mitchell, oh, yeah. we talking about Pretty Boy Town, and all these. Really? You know what I'm saying? Um, A lot of brothers falling victim, uh, being single mothers, single fathers, being raised by Nana. Grandpa, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you um, um, for, uh, were fortunate enough to have both parents in the household, yep. uh, uh, very religious, and we can mm -hmm. speak upon that uh, mm -hmm. as well. Uh, but to keep focus, 4.0 student graduating from high hey. school, you know, at, <laughs> at a high level. Uh, let's speak a bit about that, man. Some of the challenges yeah. that you faced, you know what I'm saying? Being in the town now, we got to tap that, we got to tap that. Right? Sorry, yeah. You know what I mean? That's, that's a big thing, man. How many people do you know out there that's, that's listening or how many people that you know that can honestly say they've never been arrested? You know Man, what I'm saying? Up until uh, that point, like, you know, <laughs> you know, crazy. That, that's crazy. Yeah. So salute to you on that, brother. It uh, was just, it. with me growing up, I was born in 1980. Um, if you're from the town and your parents was on welfare, your mother's doctor was more than likely uh, Howard Daniel. He's still in the hundreds. Mm. Um, so you were more than likely born at this hospital called Vesper Memorial. It's called, uh, 
I want to say physicians, community. So if you're driving to Bayfair on 580 and you pass a hospital on the way to Bayfair, like when you get off 150th, that's the hospital where most welfare kids are born at if you're from Oh, is it, uh, John, it's John George now, right? No, that's the crazy house. Oh, that's the crazy <laughs> house. I hope we ain't born there. Oh, oh shit, that's we don't shit, that's shit. There. It's the reason, the reason. But no, so just growing up, born and raised in Oakland, well, born in San Leandro, but you know, that's where you had to go. It was different, like, my parents both ended up getting in drugs when I was about seven or eight years old. And prior to that, we lived a great life. Dad worked, sold weed, mom sold weed, even though she don't want me to talk about it, but it is what it is. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Never um, just dying and they worked, my daddy worked three, four jobs. He had three, they had three kids by the time she was 17 and he was 19. So you. Think about that, just growing up in that section and just dealing with that. And then crack came, they split up. Um, I remember living in shelters and stuff before with my mom until she could get back on her feet. Um, just talking about this recently, just, I went through typical, well, it may not be typical, but I went through stuff. Like I had to, went through the custody battles. Um, I, like I said, lived in shelters. I went to a parent house and then was told we was going to a parent house, but then we ended up at the grandparent house. And I'm like, man, I want to go live with either a parent or, or, or not a parent. You know what I mean? So just going through all that, I always had the mind state of, and it was not even cognizant to me. I didn't realize I had the mindset until I got older, but I always thought about solutions rather than worry about problems. And I knew the only thing that I could control is if I could control. I could control my stuff in school. I knew that if I did good in school, I could have freedom to go run the fuck around, do whatever I wanted. So when I caught my I got my first job at 13, um, working for the city, like they don't even have these, what, YEP is still open, we gotta talk about that. Hey, the YEP program is still too, open. Man. So the YEP was how I got my first job, I was 13. At age of 13, I realized the value of me having my own money. When I got my first check, I went to Brown's Brothers in Alameda and bought my first pair of shoes on my own. So I was like, all right, I like to work. And I just took that mindset <laughs> all the while doing that. My daddy had already taught me about detailing. My daddy been a master detailer since before I was born. I detailed my first car when I was eight. So mind wow. you, all the while learning this, learning, I know how to paint, I know how to cut grass. Yeah, my daddy did his drugs, but he taught us how to do shit. Jack of all trades. You understand what yeah, I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. What, would, what would you say um, attributed to you not choosing the so-called easy path and like joining a gang and selling drugs or something to mm -hmm. make quick money? Was it because you learned all of these skills at a very young age it and, was, it, and those skills just came easy to you? It or? was that and I wanted to go to jail. Period. Like oh, yeah. I, I knew that because we didn't have gangs in Oakland. We everything was ran on turf. turf. For sure. But everybody Definitely. sold their weed on a turf, which was advertising that you were selling weed. So with me growing up, I, weed was never like a secret to me. Weed has been in my family since forever. Like I've known, like we've been sneaking in the room, yeah. smelling them while they <laughs> playing dominoes. No is that like, a skunk in this room? It was room? never a secret. Like they didn't hide it from us. It was like they didn't smoke in the room with us, but it was never like a secret. Yeah. So I always looked That's at funny. cannabis as like a business. Like this is a way mm. to supply people with a product that they want. So for me, at a, when I started selling weed in 1996, I was 16 years old. I realized that it would be easier for me to sell weed at where I work than on the streets. So and once I realized that, I was like, wait a minute. I ain't got to worry about getting paid because you work where I work. I know when you get paid. I don't got to worry about you snitching on me because, again, you're buying you something. So me. I can pick my clientele. I didn't have to worry about a decoy. And if you did snitch on me, you'd be messing off of everybody else. So why would you do that? And that worked for me from 96 for until sure. I got snitched on in 2005. Right. Would you Man. say that it was easy for you to maintain your, your school and your grades and everything? Or mm -hmm. were there were there like temptations or distractions to you? I had good people in my corner. Even though my parents did what they did, they both got their life back together, for moved sure. back with my mom. Pops got his stuff together, moved on with my other mom. I don't call her my stepmom, my other mom. Got you. And no, I just kept thriving. Like I had big, I didn't have no big brothers, but one of my good friends, Terrell, um, he is the pit master for DJ's tri-tip, the barbecue spot. Oh, That's, That's my boy. Max. So DJ boy. he was like my brother and he had cousins and big homies that we all used to fuck with. Yeah. And they kept us grounded. They was gotcha. like, when lunch was over, take y'all punk asses back to school. Hell yeah. You know That's what I'm saying? What's like missing. We That's had the OGs that was really yeah. like, nah, we, we know that y'all see what we doing. But Holding the youngsters for accountable for yeah. themselves. Yeah. Sometimes you can't, like, I had partners I couldn't avoid it. They jumped in. But for me, again, my main motivation was to not go to jail. I All did right. not. I, I respected my freedom and I don't like penis. So I just, <laughs> I, I, anything that I could Don't do. Drop the soap. 
man, I just, I couldn't. So it was like, I, I had to really just focus. Walk around and on, baby. Right. That's what I was on. Like it just, I knew early on, I wanted to be in the cannabis business, but I didn't see this coming at Got all, you, man. Yeah. at all. Ask me how I feel about the marijuana. I tell you that I love it like I love my mama. We don't do confusion and all the drama. We be with the crew, little Benny Hanna. California State, cheaper up north. Get it to the bay, it's some buck more. Travel up top, what the fuck for? They ain't even got what a nigga rock. Gelato in my bra with the cookie crumb. On my Instagram, putting hella thumbs. Fuck around, you gon' need another lung. We kinda all grew up in, in the thick of, of like the real true freedom of the, before Prop 50. 215 and then when it hit like mm -hmm. i mean I, I remember literally like a couple of blocks there. down there going to get ace for like 20 bucks fire there blue dreams fire. and old school champagnes and shit yeah. you know what i'm saying <laughs> and you know uh someone that was you know the the person buying and the consuming at that point mm -hmm. it was it was like heaven you yeah. know what i mean did you ever think at a point when when stores start opening, that was something that you want to do hindsight sign in and that's what you're doing now so, that was that ever a, a <laughs> early dream 29, excuse me, 1999, I had been selling weed three years. Rest my granny soul, she on this arm. I'm taking her on her normal little errands. We always, I always just, just hang out with my granny, you know what I'm saying? And she smoked weed, she grew weed, never could dry it good, but she she had magic dirt. <laughs> if, like they had magic dirt back then, like you could throw anything in dirt back then and just water and it would grow. You know what I'm saying? If you know, if you are of a certain age, you know about that dirt, you know what I'm saying? So true. she she had me take her weed ride on an errand one day. We pull up to 19th and Telegraph. Um, I don't know what we was pulling up to. She just said she's going to get meds. <laughs> she come out the store. She got a white bag. She, I say, what's that, Granny? She say, it's weed. I said, you bought weed out of a store? She said, yeah. I said, oh, yeah, I want one of those. And um, yeah. she said, if you ever get one, I'm going to be there every day. And I was like, yeah. man, I, that next day, I went and got my cannabis card because that was when everybody was getting cannabis cards. And hey. you go to all the shops. I immersed myself in that environment those because for days, me, baby. that was the rec days. But we, ain't, we don't use rec no more. And I'm going to tell you why. I just heard about this recently. We don't say recreational no more because that makes you think it's good for kids. Mm -hmm. ah, this is true. not for kids unless it's medicinal. So medicinal. if we say recreational, they, that, 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 that's a play on the government and for us to use that to yeah. tarnish kids. So that just right. came up literally like in a Zoom yeah. I was on yesterday. Mm -hmm. So, but doing <laughs> that, as soon as she told me that that day and I immersed myself in it, I started working at cannabis clubs all up and down Hayward Frisco. I started growing weed two years later because I seen that there was money in me growing weed and selling to the stores. And then I became also something called the Cookie Man. I've been the Cookie Man since 2000. Two. I started buying weed pastries Dude, from case. cannabis clubs and then selling them to my friends. And then while doing that, I was promoting my music under hey, the cookie hey, man. Hey, and then bouncing go. around to all the clubs, like fucking with my emotion, fucking with Rick Lee, fucking with uh, Lloyd Personal Touch, nice. and just all over the bay, all in Oakland, fucking with Chris Rochelle, just all the party people <clears throat> with under the cookies. And I was just using all that to push weed man, on the work. under. I be trying yeah. to tell people so, like, you know, that real real work. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. real life, real life. Yeah, the way yeah. I network now, the way I done moved around and like, the same way I'm moving around now, you know, like I didn't, like, it ain't too many people that's doing the kind of interviews I'm doing that ain't really, I'm really a nobody per se. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but yeah, I'm depending yeah. on who you, you, you ask. You, ask but, yeah. you know what I'm For saying? Sure. Like, I'm getting it because I know how to network, I know how to move around, and I'm really a good dude, and it's not me saying that. You know what mm, I'm saying? Yes. So it's yes. just, I'm just taking it all in. You know what I mean? It is kind of, it's a lot, but. And you know how to wiggle. Making man, it happen. You, I'm trying. You've been waiting. I'm trying. Yeah, but man, that's a town. Like, if you're from the Bay, you know about hustle. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? You know, like, you know what I'm saying? I don't know what y'all parents told y'all, but I know my daddy told me, as a black man, as a man in general, you're going to have to hustle. I don't necessarily mean on triple beam, his words, and he still has his triple beam. You hear me? You know what I'm saying? But he was like, that. you just got to learn how to do something. You got to know how to do something. Like, while I'm doing all this cookie man shit yeah. and all this selling weed and all this party promoter, I'm detailing cars for all my coworkers. So I'm eating three, four different ways at work. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, man. Come on, that's a cheer. Come on, man. I ain't gotta, I ain't, Come on, hey, man. Hey, no, the fuck is just pushing these apps and getting paid in a different way. There's like, no jail involved with that. Niggas went from skipping rocks for fun to like, having to really do that to hustle. I mean, you like, had to. like some. You said some shit took me back to thinking what I had to do, you know what I'm saying, to wiggle to get that $40 for that eighth back in high school, bro. You know what I'm saying? Dude. You know what I mean? How that shit stretched. You can smoke a $40 eighth for at least damn near four days out the week. I remember when eighths would get you seven 
swishers every time. <laughs> man, Nigga, that's that's from that you didn't have to roll man, it out. That swishers a point that. five. Man, man yeah. Yeah. Hope he's hitting it. Yeah, man, look. So Coming up real. in that era, your Cookie Man, mm -hmm. you kind of gravitated towards getting more in depth for your dream mm -hmm. and hitting Oaksterdam. Mm -hmm. uh, speak on uh, on what made you transition to actually go to there. Because I mean, that shit when in, when you took it, it was it was fairly new back then. Right? I was in the second or third class Oaksterdam ever had in Oakland. Yeah, see, so. It what it was for me again. I said, I, in 1999, I immersed myself in it. So, from 99 until 2008, when I went to Amsterdam, I tried to open a store twice, but I was told just by different people in the industry that black people would never own stores. I never really asked why, but that's just what that was just the running thing. Y'all ain't gonna be able to own in this space. So you it's know, cold when they hit us with the y'all. You know, that's what I took that for what it was, kept grinding, <laughs> but I got tired. So when I heard about Amsterdam. It was kind of like a rejuvenation thing for me. It was like, wait a minute, I can pay. At this time, it was $300. That Man. was a zip of weed. I can pay you a zip of weed what? to come learn about legal stuff in cannabis, how to move around with attorneys, uh, how to grow weed better. I'm like, by then, I'm already, the weed I'm growing, it's 08. The weed I'm growing that I started growing in 01, I've already got in stores. I'm already set, putting weed from my gardens, me and my cousin gardens, in stores already at this point. But I knew if I want to open a store, I would this. I thought in my mind this would be something I would need to go do. This is a weed school. Yeah, yeah. but I was got laughed at. Like I literally gonna, laughed at. I, I ain't gonna lie. I thought that shit was fake. I wanted to do it too, but I thought it was like on that Devry shit where they take your money. <laughs> I, you know what I'm saying? Bro. Now I know how to fix a VCR. <laughs> you know you should saying? hear some like, of the stuff I don't heard, mean nothing, bro. Like I got laughed at for going. Um, my wife, I love her to death. She wasn't mad that I was going, but we had literally just had Kamaya. Kamai was born in January of 08. I started school March of 08. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. I started school in September of 07 and was still going when my daughter was born. Okay. And my daughter was a preemie. So I'm having to go back and forth oh, to the wow. hospital, then trying to go to school. Damn, but bro. old lady understood it for, I mean, I yelled at a little bit, but she understood for what it was. Hey, and man, look at where we are now. For a reason, boy, I'm telling you. Know you know what I'm saying? When, when they told you mm -hmm. that a black person mm -hmm. would never own a mm -hmm. cat. Like, do you think that that came, that that statement was made out of a pure sense of racism? Or do you think it came from like, this is just the way it is and they didn't see it ever changing? I think that's what it was. Cause the people I'm talking about, I know for a fact weren't racist. These was my, gotcha. I hate, I always say the wrong term. <laughs> term. <laughs> my Indian friends, gotcha. you. you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so, yeah. Did they, and so now I knew that they weren't, you know, and then my white man, <laughs> The white, my white friend who worked at the store, the cannabis club where I met the cookie lady at, the lady I buy my cookies from, yes. he was, I knew they weren't racist. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, so I knew sure. where they was coming from. They was like, man, the higher that, the, the, up, the higher ups just won't let it happen. Who the fuck are the higher ups? How did it make you feel when you finally did become? <laughs> so I got to send y'all the link. So Jan, uh, July 31st, 2018, when we won, because it was a lottery. So that's when wow. OT say that this was like some destiny shit. The way that's I won right. my license, they had 66 applications for the equity license. 36 of those applications made it to a bingo ball lottery where wow. each person or brand picked a bingo ball, threw it in a chamber. They rolled the shit around. If they picked your ball, you lost. If you were one of the four remaining balls after they went through picking all the balls, you won a license. Man, Nick. So, bro, when he when I first wow. met him and he told me this story, like so, I can, it was I can feel like it was that's some real shit, bro. So when destined. we won, the first thing I said, I don't know who who y'all pray to, whoever you call yes, him, that's yes, your business. Yes. I call him Yahweh. So when I won, I stood up, I said, Praise Yahweh, I got my store. We hadn't had a location. We didn't have all we had was knowing we had the license. The green light. But I yeah. knew right then in that moment. From when I talked to my granny, not too far from where I got my license, and I mean, and you know, where I got my license, where I talked to her in '99 and told her I wanted one, I knew I That's was amazing. on my way to having one. That's amazing. That feeling felt fucking amazing, oh, and I, I still deal it. with it now, <laughs> even just talking about it, because it's like, yeah. damn, that really just happened. Everything you've ever done put you here. That's yeah, all your network and all your moving real. around, all the good relationships you built, not being just, uh, everything has led to this moment and you didn't even know. You was just, mm -hmm. Man, mm -hmm. yeah. I try to tell people, mm -hmm. you can go so too, far in life off of just being nice. Like, Dude, see, I wear it on my wrist, so I be a good person. <laughs> just be a good person, hey, Man, honestly, that's all it takes. I, I met Techie almost four and a half, five years ago and it was just off being nice, being on the come up. He, he, he knew he needed people in the streets promoting his business. He was going to major radios. He was going to all the mom and pops. He circled to us. 
it was a good fit, and he and he took that initiative to really fuck with with, with me and my mm -hmm. group, and mm -hmm. it touched me because we, we'll weigh in on his partnership, how he ended up getting everything, and it all his true destiny came through, and and the Blunts and More was truly conformed, and they it really started full booming. circle. Yeah, but uh, you know this dude was me, always just genuinely nice. Through the whole, I, I met this fool the very first day I actually walked up on him. I fucking met Montel. I told you guys the story. <laughs> oh, you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I roll up and he's fucking with Montel Williams. Montel bro. Williams, that, that, like, that is. Uncle Montel, Damn, man. you just brought that back. Like, come that on, is like, when I first how, met you, how, how, how is that? Get out of my way. We were talking. We were doing the professional thing. He sent me the bio. That. We was talking. We finally yeah, met. Even, and it he was said, "Come through." And it wasn't G. like he told me to come through. He was there. That they was doing their business, and we popped I didn't even up. Tell him. And it was just, it was crazy. We we got school with fucking Montel school us on CBD and his, his product and everything. And I was like ignorant. I didn't even really know it. Yeah. CBN and yeah. CBD and all those other uh, things that you get from, from cannabis. You know what I mean? I was completely blind. I didn't really know that the, the shit then, but he that. gamed us up. That was my first from this. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I just seen him since, network though. from every yeah, person man. he deals with. He's just so humble, so caring yeah. and so giving. And I think that's, that's one of the things that really stand up about him. That's what makes people want to deal with certain people. Yeah. You know? yeah. If you're an asshole, then they're I mean, yeah, it's the law of attraction. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, you got to have that at a certain point. You know, you can't be called the happy store and not be happy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> hey, but they, they will fuck you up. This is some unhappy times in cannabis, but yeah, you, you know, would that's, do it all. Yeah, yeah it's, it's just the people that are making the laws for the space don't know shit about don't the space. Know. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. We're sure. we're opening doors now. Like I've been talks with uh, people in New York. I've been talks with uh, people in New Jersey. So other places that are coming online are reaching out to people in the space to talk to them about how shit should be crafted because the way they did a lot of the stuff in Cali was based on two things that you shouldn't base legalization on. They based on making hella money, which sounds cute, but just wait. Oh, yeah. And they based it on killing the illicit market. Now, get, get over the illicit market. It's never going to go anywhere. People are always going to want to buy weed from the streets. There's always mm -hmm. going to be people that want to get over that. It is what it is. And then wanting to make extra amount of money if you're gonna make that you gotta have an asterisk by it you cannot make a whole bunch of money by overtaxing us no. a lot of people don't get that yeah and until they understand that less is more and actually sit down and talk to us and Stay let them again. understand mm -hmm. that if you lower the tax people are gonna spend more money which then gets you more yes. money <laughs> but being that so simple what they see on paper is cannabis for the last four years has made more money in california than the automobile industry and these course. are facts. It's a, it's up the deficit. That's why the surplus is always so big. They got extra dough. And granted, that's we've great. We've keeping it up. And they, they see that. So for them, they're like, why the fuck would we lower? We're getting all this money. You would lower because, again, less is more. <laughs> I can give you more if you lower. More so sales, yeah. It just, it, they don't, they don't, they got it. It's like a plumber telling somebody how to DJ. <laughs> or a commentator trying to tell a football player or a basketball player about how their performance was for the night. So <laughs> it's just, you know, it's just, you know, get, get in the rooms and we are getting in them. But just like with everything else, and then plus two, you got to get everybody out. Why are we still in jail? Your whole ass making money yeah, off man. people selling weed and we have people in jail right. for selling weed. 20 some man. years for some trees, though. I'm how do you justify that tax, Dude, though? This is so, a, so aggressive. Um, you can't. They do. It's actually illegal what they're doing with the taxes and with the insurance. Those are two things that are really like I, I, I feel illegal. Mm. It should be like, like we need like some uh, seven on your side coverage yeah, or like. Dude. Some, hey, they don't want to like call New York Finney. Times because like we know for real <laughs> like the, what's really going it's on. It's ridiculous, bro. Yeah. Don't if, ever try to buy no weed off the weed maps, bro. If, if I go three more years now, like this, I will have to sell my license. There'd be no point for me to stay in Oakland. Like, why would I want to stay somewhere and I'm not making a dime? I haven't yeah. made money in three years. You get you get on Damn. good panels. Uh, you be on a lot of panels, and you get some big hitters on there. And you guys talk about the laws daily, and you school a lot of people that don't know. Uh, you get a lot of youngsters wanting to be growers mm -hmm. and don't know, and you you really school them. You know, on on, on the art form of, of the craft that that's not where the money's at. No, and you try to tell people about you know some of your successes and the failures in the game. You know, going anywhere. You're year four now. Year five yeah, now. Yeah, year four. Yeah, year four. 18 and it's 22, so yeah, we in year four. I just, I don't want everybody to think the shit is fucking Not glitz and glamour. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. Like everybody thinks, and this is this is Man, no, it's the gazillionaire. This I is no uh, no hate, no shade or nothing, because that's that's fam. But everybody thinks. Everything is cookies. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Everybody thinks there's just a bunch of money flowing around and not knowing. 
shit, Cookies got hella shit going on. They still trying to make sure they make the moves right in order because they see what's going on. It's not like so every if you, I take a survey right now, we just opened up. We had a phone line here and we took a survey. Just blind surveys ask people what they want to do if they get in the cannabis space. First two things they're going to say is grow and sell. Those two things are the two most expensive things to right. do and the two that take the longest time to make money in California. Long game, right? Now, if it was anywhere else, if I took this same motto to Oklahoma or somewhere else that's upstarting, I'd be a millionaire in a year. Six months, maybe. But in California, with the overtaxation on plant touching, what's plant touching? Growing and selling. With that tax like that, you can't make any money. But don't, don't trip you guys. Everything that a business needs, cannabis needs. They're called ancillary jobs. You can do that and make money now. If you want to open a dispensary, have five million to burn that you're not going to get back and then be ready to not make money for three to five years. If you can do that, go ahead, set you up a grow operation, set you up a dispensary. Well, why would you do that, do that if you can do something else now? Do money. packaging. You can, yeah. I mean, you're so com so podcasting. Yeah. Like, you, yeah. like, there's so much you can do for the cannabis space without touching the plant. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to tell people so they're not just getting in here blind. I want to educate them as best as I can.